So what can you actually do about root lesion nematodes? I think one of the big things which will come through in the next bit, sow a tolerant variety. You'll maximise your profits in the presence of these nematodes. And certainly from data we got last year, avoid late sowing. You make your losses worse if you delay your sowing. So how we come to these conclusions, basically based on two trials from last year, um, where we had five barley varieties, four durum varieties and nine breadwheat varieties. All these trials we actually had separate plots, either inoculated sowing with the crown rot fungus, a different disease, or we didn't inoculate them. And two sowing dates and we had two sites, one at, at uh, Mungandai and one at Canamble. So basically 432 plots of data uh, underline what these next couple of slides. I won't spend a lot of time on this. This is just the actual yield of all those varieties at Mungandai. So we had a high starting population of Prelancus thornii, 18,500, um, and, we, and we followed that through. So certainly we only got four situations where we got a significant yield difference between uh, the early sowing on the 10th of May and the second sowing on the 22nd of June. It was quite a soft year out there for Mung Mungandai, pretty uncharacteristic uh, with cooler temperatures during grain fill and good moisture all year. So we only got a significant benefit of the second sowing time in Janderoy, and in our three uh, in intolerant varieties, Sunvex, Ellison and Streslecki, we actually got an 11% yield reduction uh, by delaying sowing. Whereas if you go to Canamble, it was a tougher year uh, out in Canamble. Uh, there we got a significant yield loss uh, with our second sowing time on the 22nd of June in all varieties compared to that first sowing time on the 20th of May. So how do you actually interpret this data? What, you, what we basically do is then look at the resistance ratings to Pradlankus thorny acro across those uh, different different crop species. So we basically know that all the, the barleys uh, are moderately tolerant. Caparoy and Hyperna, once you get into the durums, are actually moderately tolerant, whereas EGA, Belleroy and Janderoy are moderately intolerant. You can see those drop-offs in yield. And certainly within the bread wheat, we've got varieties that are moderately tolerant. Then we've got three varieties here, Sun 627A, Spitfire and Bounty, which are all moderately tolerant to moderately intolerant. Livingston, Crusader, moderately intolerant. And Sunvax, Ellison, Streslecki, uh, intolerant to very intolerant. And you can see the, how that is affecting the yield outcomes uh, at Canamble on a, on a lower starting population, 5,500 Pradlankus so the only way we can really uh, compare the impact of the nematodes is by comparing to our most tolerant variety, which happens to be EGA Gregory uh, in these trials, which is moderately tolerant. So when we do that for the first sowing time, 10th of May at Mungandai, swapping from a moderately tolerant variety into a, a lower tolerance class, you've lost about 5% yield on the first sowing time, jumps to 10% when you've gone down from a moderately tolerant to a moderately intolerant variety. And if you had have sown an intolerant variety, so those, those three intolerant varieties in that season, you can see the bars up around 25% yield loss. With the second sowing to Mungandai, you can see, see there's a, a trend there, certainly with the, the other classes, that as you delayed sowing, your losses across all those lower uh, tolerance levels uh, actually increases. Uh, so that you've gone from 25% yield loss in an intolerant variety, the red bar there, at the first sowing time to over uh, 30, about 32, 33% uh, on the second sowing time. Both had pretty de reasonable in crop rainfall, for 243 mils in the first sowing time and 228 mils in the second sowing time uh, at Mungandai. If you look at this at Canamble again, that 5,500 starting lower population, still as you change your tolerance class, you're getting yield loss. So 10% uh, from going to a moderate tolerant, non intolerant varieties. Uh, a bit over that with the modern intolerant and jumping up over 25% if you're intolerant. Uh, Canamble, certainly that first sowing time got in and got a, a, a lucky rainfall event and established well. If we look at the so second sowing time at Canamble in, in 2011, um, certainly was quite dry after sowing, restricted that early root growth, so your nematodes have a lot more impact. So jumping uh, out of a moderately tolerant variety uh, into a lower tolerance class there cost us 25% from that second sowing time. 35% when you went into moderately intolerant varieties, and if you had have sown uh, intolerant to very intolerant varieties on that second sowing time canal, you're up over 40% yield loss with that red bar there. So certainly have a big impact. So the key messages there, I guess, are certainly later sowing increases your losses from root lesion nematodes, and there certainly appears to be uh, a situation there that under drier conditions, uh, your impact of your nematodes are greater, which, which makes a fair bit of sense that if you, you've got dry soil, you don't have that chance to compensate with, with additional root growth. So your nematodes will really knock you around a lot more. 
I guess we've covered nematodes now. What about crown rot? So certainly at Mungandai, we know it was, was quite soft. We didn't get a significant effect from our crown rot at that site. So crown rot yield loss is all about moisture stress during grain fill. Mungandai was very mild and uh, wet finish, so we didn't get that. However, at Canamble, uh, it was tougher tougher season there. So what we're looking at here is the difference between our inoculated plots with crown rot and our un-inoculated un plots. Uh, we can see in a moderately tolerant variety Gregory here, we still got over 20% uh, yield loss from crown rot on the first sowing time and over 30% on the second sowing time. Along the bottom, we've actually plotted the different Pratolenchus thornii, so the nematode tolerance ratings. All I want to point out here is that there is not a relationship between the tolerance of a variety to crown rot and its tolerance to Pratolenchus thornii. They're independent. Certainly in a tougher finish, if we had got hot conditions at the end, I, uh, we've seen in other trials you get more whiteheads expressed if you haven't got a root system because you're getting challenged by nematodes, but we didn't see that in this trial. So the key message then there, I guess, is uh, this has got a bit confused over the last few years. Certainly both diseases, so nematodes and crown rot, are significant diseases in the northern region. So if you look at it, at Canamble, 2011, we've got 43% yield loss we could attribute to a lack of tolerance to Pratolenchus thornii. And similarly, we got around 37% yield loss from crown rot in that year, and that's a year we know... Uh, wasn't overly conducive to yield loss com from crown rot. We know we can get more in tougher finishes. Certainly crown rot tolerance is not related to Pratolenchus thornii tolerance. So you can't pick one and you solve the other problem. They're independent uh, mechanisms. A key thing here, which hopefully doesn't get confused, um, but actual changes, by changing your individual wheat variety, the difference is actually smaller with crown rot than what they are with Pratolenchus thornii. So if you look on your, your first sowing time at Canamble, 20th of May, by changing between bread wheat varieties, you could actually have a 14% impact on your yield out outcomes. And on the second sowing time, it was 22%. Okay, so there is value in jumping around varieties, but certainly as the next one shows, it's smaller than with jumping between tolerances with your Pratolenchus thornii, your nematodes. So on the 20th of May sowing with the nematodes, if you jump between wheat varieties, you could have a 28% effect on your yield outcome. And at the second time, up to f second sowing time, up to 48% uh, impact on your yield outcomes. So certainly the impacts are, are different there. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I think the key message there is is certainly uh, in a high nematode situation, so if you've got a lot of Pratolenchus thornii on your soil, consider your nematode rating of your variety first before your crown rot rating. And I guess certainly variety tolerance is a key tool with uh, the nematodes in maximising your profits, but it's not the main tool with crown rot. The differences there uh, aren't, aren't big enough. So still rotation is your main key with, with crown rot. So what can we actually do to manage root lesion nematodes? I think the first key point is they're not in every single paddock, uh, which certainly the survey has shown. They spread with soil and can move with, with floodwaters. So certainly one of the, the, the main ways if you've got a clean paddock is trying to keep it clean. So... Certainly they can move in soil with farm machinery and certainly if you have got paddocks which have got nematodes and don't have them, you should plant your paddocks which are free of nematodes first within your program and leave the ones with nematodes last. Certainly hopefully you, from the presentation you've seen that growing tolerant cereal varieties um, will maximise your yield in the presence of nematodes but again you need to know which species you've got whether it's thorny eye or neglectus. And certainly rotating with resistant crops will help to keep populations at low levels or reduce their, their levels. But again, it depends on the species, which the last little bit we'll cover. And to do that, you basically got to test your soil, whether it be the uh, DNA predictor B test we, we used here through SARDI or manual counts, which you can get through done through the Queensland Department at Toowoomba. Okay, so certainly within looking at rotation crops. So within our winter cereals, barley um, is moderate resistant to moderately susceptible. So this is the build-up of populations within the roots within a season. A season is moderate resistant, moderate susceptible to both Pratolenchus thornii and Pratolenchus neglectus, whereas Durum is resistant to Pratolenchus thornii and moderately susceptible to Pratolenchus neglectus. And we can see here wheat is susceptible to both. Um, so that's a pretty broad uh, rule of thumb that's been put out by the Queensland government through work they've been doing. The key question, I guess, is but are all varieties within those actually the same? So here we go back to some uh, work we did at Canamble in 2009, looking at a range, again, of uh, barley varieties, durum and bread wheat varieties, and their build-up of populations within the season, their resistance. What I can see here, we basically get the general trend, lower populations with our barley, resistant uh, 
uh, Durham's resistant to Prolancus thornii, so we've got low, lot lower populations here after our Durham, so Hyperno, Copori, Jandroy and Veloroy. But when you get in with the breadweeds here, you can see there's quite a big range. So even though we, we consider them all susceptible, which variety you can pick actually has a big impact on the numbers you leave behind. So same varieties down here like Gregory, Livingston, Wiley, um, certainly still built the nematodes up, but nowhere near as much as something like a Streslecki. So the build-up in population over one season was 5.6 times higher in Streslecki versus Gregory and those other varieties. So putting the wrong variety in there in one season can take your population right up to uh, nearly 40,000, um, as opposed to keeping it uh, down at lower levels. In terms of actual break crops, um, so canola is uh, considered resistant to Prolancus thornii but susceptible to Prolancus neglectus. Faber beans are susceptible to Prolancus thornii but resistant to Prolancus neglectus, so it goes the other way. And chickpeas are generally considered to susceptible to both uh, species of root lesion nematode. Again, this is based on Queensland uh, DPI data. But again, the question is, are all varieties actually the same? So here we go uh, uh, back to that work that we did in at the chickpea uh, trial at Come By Chance. And I guess, are we making the most of MVT system in our break crops? So remembering back at Come By Chance, we called that NVT, chickpea MVT site at sowing in 2010, and we had just over 2,000 nematodes in that topsoil. When we went back in the next year and looked what the different chickpea varieties left behind, you could see there's quite a big range. So a lot of these uh, are numbered lines, and you can see some of your, your more recognised varieties, Jim Bore, PBA Hattrick. Certainly they're all considered susceptible, they all built them up above the 2000, so we started down around this, this 2000 level. We've had a three times increase here with some of these varieties down here, as opposed to an eight and a half time increase as we get up into to some of these later ones like circa 0911. So certainly I think we need to evolve to the situation where we understand this information more and how much even individual chickpea varieties are having within our, our system and manage them throughout the whole rotation.